y'all give a great big welcome to Michael Reno Harold to the Big Play Live. <laughs> clothespin between her teeth. She was reaching for the corner of a twin bed sheet. A whole week's laundry on the line when she heard the doorbell chime. It was the Avon lady, Leanne Brewer, bringing Mama's Avon order to her. Had lipstick and a little perfume, then coffee in the living room. It made Mama's day little things like that. Was a Tupperware bowl on a rubber made place mat. She'd drive to the Woolworth five and dime just to ride the escalator and kept a half a gallon of peach ice cream and our old Calvinator. Well, Daddy shined up his cowboy boots. Mama pressed Daddy's Sunday suit. When once a year they go out to eat for Mama's birthday treat. They'd drive the truck across the county line, have T-bone steak and store-bought wine, dance till the Moose Lodge locked the doors and get home about half past four. It made Mama's day little things like that. All it took was a new hairdo and a cute little pillbox hat. She'd drive to the Woolworth five and dime Just to ride the escalator And kept a half a gallon of peach ice cream And our old Calvinator Sick with a female matter So daddy'd sit by her And he'd look right at her Then he'd sneak out back And smoke a cigarette But he was praying Underneath his breath Well she couldn't do nothing Cause the doc wouldn't let her So grandma stayed Till mama got better We all chipped in And daddy bought flowers And it made mama grin For hours It made mama's day Little things like that Was her favorite book and her blue-eyed Siamese cat She'd drive to the Woolworth five and dime Just to ride the escalator And kept a half a gallon of peach ice cream And our old Calvinator Yeah, we always had some peach ice cream And our old Calvinator Thank you, Mama, for all the ice cream and all the love I don't know. Y'all may have been a Frigidaire family. I don't know. We were Calvinator people. Uh, it's great to be back at Barley's and great to be on my favorite radio station in the whole wide world. And I'd like to say hello to the whole wide world because I know people in California and Oregon and <clears throat> a bunch of my friends around the world listening to us here. And uh, can't be a better place to be than Barley's on a Friday. I'll do you a tune here uh, for all of us who do what I do for a living, drive. <laughs> we get paid to drive, we do this for free. Eventually you're right about what you do. Turn to snow. I got one good wiper blade, a cup of coffee, and a hundred miles to go. Before I feel your loving arms or taste your sweet lips kissing me, hello. Well, I'd have been home by now, but the van ran out of 
of gas on 26. The gauge is broken. Yeah, I know you told me that I ought to get it fixed. Got the Appalachian Mountains yet to cross in what they call a wintry mix. So say a prayer for me in this old van. The tires are getting pretty slick. Say a prayer for this old pilgrim out here on the road tonight. Say a prayer for all the children who have no one to hold them tight. Don't forget about the soldiers and her loved ones who've gone on and then say a prayer for peace and that we all make it safely home few CDs Made some new friends out in Texas Saw some old friends here in Tennessee I'll admit the snow looks pretty And the headlights shining on the trees I just hope they get the salt trucks rolling Before the asphalt starts to freeze Say a prayer for this old pilgrim Out here on the road tonight Say a prayer for all the children Who have no one to hold them tight Don't forget about the soldiers And our loved ones who've gone on And then say a prayer for peace safely home I'll say a prayer for peace and that we all make it safely home thank you very much you know those of us who do what I do you travel around well they used to uh, back when I was on a a record label they would send you out on those radio tours you just drive from one little radio station like WDBX to the next community or college radio station whatever it was I was doing a show in in uh, Cambridge Massachusetts across the river there from Boston and I was gonna do an afternoon uh, four o'clock on air at WUMB radio well I'd never been there before so I drove out and found the college and found the radio station and I walked in the front door and there was this lady sitting behind the counter there. And she said, may I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm Michael Reno Harrell. I'm from North Carolina and I'm supposed to be on the radio here today about four o'clock. She said, well, wait right here. And I said, all right. And she went in the back and she was gone about four or five minutes and she came back and she had about six other women with her and they all lined up and she looked at me and said, say something. <laughs> so a lot of times I try to carry a translator with me but uh, I don't need one here y'all understand me uh, I was uh, had a tour down in Florida several years ago and, and the tour started off in a place I never had been a place called Mount Dora Florida well, being from East Tennessee and Western North Carolina, I thought, well, I'll go down there and see their mountain. I tell you what, it don't take much elevation to impress people in Florida. Uh, you don't need to take your hiking boots when you climb Mount Dora, I can tell you that. There's an alligator on top of it when I got there. Uh, we had uh, some Florida weather in, in 04 in our part of the country over there in the mountains of Western North Carolina where we live. Uh, 
there was a hurricane called Ivan that came across Florida. I think Florida got five hurricanes that year. And uh, there was a hurricane that came across the peninsula and got out in the Gulf of Mexico there and sucked up some water and thought, well, that was fun. I wonder what else I can get into. So it just came north and it came to our mountains right up there around Asheville and just squatted for about a week and just about washed us away. Well, when I got down there to Mount Dora, I thought, well, I'll tell people what's going on back home. I said, we got a hurricane and it rained real hard. I got no sympathy at all from them people down there. But I did get a song out of it. I'm about to blow out a finger picker, hang on. I think I've played in something like 45 states or something like that. Been around several, several, several places over in Europe and stuff like that. And uh, tell people a little bit about my family and where I'm from. And, and uh, tell people my daddy's from Mitchell County, North Carolina. And people in California don't know where Mitchell County, North Carolina is for some reason, and then I say, well, you probably heard of Mount Mitchell, the tallest mountain east of the Rockies, and people go, oh, yeah, now we know where you're talking about. I said, not really, that's not in Mitchell County, but <laughs> you can see Mitchell County from there, 
But when I tell people that my mother's from Buncombe County, North Carolina, everybody knows where Buncombe County is because that's where Asheville is and all their kids live there now. They, whew, I never thought I'd see tower cranes working in Asheville, but it's whew, crazy over there. Uh, my, uh, my dad's dad uh, left the mountains in 1925. He, uh, he was down at the store at Buledine one day and there was a man down there passing out pamphlets that said that if you would move to Spartanburg, South Carolina and go to work in a cotton mill that they would rent you a house for $3 a month that had light bulbs in it. Well, my granddaddy had seen a picture of a light bulb once, but he'd never really seen one, so he thought, well, that sounds pretty good. And to sweeten the deal, the guy said, as a matter of fact, we'll buy you a train ticket down there. We'll buy your wife a train ticket, all your children a train ticket to Spartanburg, and your milk cow. Well, who wouldn't want to take their cow to Spartanburg? So my dad grew up in a mill town down there in South Carolina, but my mama's people were from the mountains of Western North Carolina also, as I said, and they didn't leave. They stayed right there. My mother grew up in a place called the Milk Sick Cove. Milk Sick Cove. I asked Mama one time, I said, why in the world do you think anybody would name a place the Milk Sick Cove? And Mama looked at me and grinned and said, honey, I don't know, maybe there are a lot of lactose intolerant people there at one time. <laughs> Now, my mama's daddy was a pretty famous fellow over in that part of the country. His name was Motorcycle Eddie Cole. I think he was on his birth certificate. He had a 1914 Indian V-twin. Rode it everywhere he went by all accounts. Well, I never did know him. He died in 1941. I wasn't born in 1948, but I knew everything about him because I knew his best friend. His best friend... <clears throat> was an old man by the name of Stover Mason. When I was 10, Stover was 80. And he was he was the best friend I think I ever had other than a German shepherd dog named Ebo one time. But he'd tell me stories about my granddaddy. I asked him one time, I said, did my granddaddy really ride that motorcycle everywhere he went? And he looked at me and said, son, he'd crank it up to go to outhouse. <laughs> now, Stover... Uh, Stover and I were, like I say, we were close buddies, good friends. And then that, that became even bigger because my granddaddy, my dad's dad, died when I was 10 years old down in Spartanburg. We went down there and buried him in the cemetery. Come back over to Candler over there where my mama's people live and was at my Aunt Asley and Uncle Serber's house sitting on the front steps crying because I didn't have a grandfather anymore. Well, about that time, this old ton and a half international steak bed truck pulled up in the driveway, and it was old man Stover Mason. It was Christmas time, and he'd come to wish us a Merry Christmas. He saw me down there sitting on the steps crying by myself. Everybody else was in the house wrapping Christmas presents. I was feeling sorry for myself because I didn't have a grandfather. Well, he come down there and sat down next to me and said, what in the world is wrong with you? And I told him what had happened. He said, oh, that's no good. He said, the boy's got to have a grandfather. I said, well, I ain't got one anymore. He said, we can fix that. I said, how? He said, why don't we adopt one another? I said, can we do that? He said, well, I don't see why not. He said, people adopt each other all the time. I said, well, wouldn't we have to have paperwork on or something like that? And he said, well, yeah, of course you got to have paperwork. He went over to his truck and opened the passenger side door and mashed that button on the dash and the glove box door fell open. He reached in, got a receipt for a set of tires. <laughs> Brought that yellow sheet of paper over where I was sitting. Said, scoot over. I did. And he laid it face down and got a little stub of a pencil out of his overall pockets and wrote, I Stover Mason adopt Michael Reno Harold as my grandson and signed his name. He said, now you... I took that pencil and I licked it and I wrote, I, Michael Reno Harrell, adopt Stover Mason as my grandfather. He said, there you go. He said, now take that home and put it where you keep your baseball card so you won't lose it. I said, it'll be in that cigar box and I'll get back to Tennessee next week. He said, now do you feel better? I said, yeah, 
Yeah, I do. He said, well, he said, we need to consummate the deal. He said, I've brought you something for Christmas. I said, really? What is it? And he reached in his pocket and he pulled out this little case double X pocket knife right here. He said, there you go. And he opened it up to that blade right there. He said, now right there, he said, that's your toothpicking and whittling blade right there. Now this other big blade here, he called, he said, now that, that, that's apple peeling and hog castrating blade. <laughs> I've had this knife 68 years and never had the nerve to open that blade. But anyway, that's my pocket knife, and this is my song about it. I got my granddaddy's pocket knife And a good dry stick of Tennessee white pine With my granddaddy's 
his pocket knife and a good dry stick of Tennessee white pine. Thank you very much, Stover Mason. I grew up in Morristown, Tennessee, well, outside of Morristown, uh, about seven miles out of town. There used to be a rayon plant there. There was one in North Carolina that all my aunts and uncles worked at. It was built by the Dutch back in the 20s. Gave everybody something to do besides cut timber and whittle. They built a plant outside of Morristown in a place called Lowland. L-O-W-L-A-N-D, Lowland. <laughs> That's East Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> anyway, my dad worked there, and uh, we had a little farm, uh, just probably about 10 or 12 acres, just a little hobby farm. Uh, but my best friend was an old boy by the name of Billy Ray Latham, L-A-F-U-M, Latham. I've asked this question all over America. Anybody ever heard that surname before, Latham? You have? I thought they just had a speech impediment. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Billy Ray and I, we rode the school bus together. We went to a Union Heights School. Now, I don't know who designed school bus routes in the 1950s in East Tennessee, but if I'm not mistaken, we came by here on the way home. It was a long bus ride. It was, we went everywhere trying to get to his house. Now, I would get off at Billy Ray's house because I loved being at Billy Ray's house because he lived down by the river there where it was flat. So we could play baseball in his field there. Our, our field was, if you hit a baseball, you'd be chasing it all the way to his house anyway, you know. We had adjoining pastures. But uh, I'd get off at Billy Ray's house because he had horses and baseball gloves and all that stuff. Plus, his daddy worked with my dad at the, at the Inca plant, but his daddy uh, had a hobby that paid for itself. He worked on old cars. He had a bunch of old cars on blocks sitting around his house. Come to think of it, just about everybody in that part of the country had a bunch of old cars on blocks around their house, but he actually worked on them. Specialized in 49, 50, and 51 Ford Flathead V8s. So anytime a car that fit that description met its demise within about a nine county radius, he'd take that old wrecker of his and go drag that Hulk back to his house and take his oxyacetylene outfit and start cutting parts off of it that were no good. And then he would weld like the front end of a black one onto the back end of a white one. And he'd put like a green door on one side and a blue door on the other side and a yellow trunk on it and a white hood, you know. My mother called them madras cars, just all colors there. And once he'd get one of them put together, he'd put it out there in front of the house on the highway and he had a, had a bottom of a beer crate that he'd made a sign with a shoe dauber out of a, you know what a shoe polish dauber is? I'm talking to the choir here. This is good. Anyway, it said fishing car. I don't. I still to this day ain't sure what a fishing car is, but evidently people needed them because he'd sell one every once in a while. Sign said fishing car and cheap, C-H-E-E-P, with an exclamation point. He'd put that under the passenger side wiper blade, and eventually somebody would drive along and go, hey, you know, I've been needing a good fishing car, and they'd buy it, and he'd be working on another one. Well, Billy and Ray and I loved playing in them old cars because as soon as we got in one of them old Fords, it would miraculously turn into a gold Cadillac and I would turn into Jerry Lee Lewis and Billy Ray would turn into Elvis and we'd be riding around Memphis waving at people, you know. But Billy Ray's dad would say, now you boys need to stay out of them old cars. He said, there's liable to be snakes in them things. Well, we were 10-year-old boys. We were looking for snakes, you know. It was a... Seemed like the thing to do. He said, no. He said, where well, I've cut them old parts off and welded them together, he said, you're just liable to cut yourself and get locked jaw. I still don't know anybody that ever had locked jaw, but it don't sound like anything you'd want. But we knew how to get in them old cars because about 5.30, the back screen door would screech open and Billy Ray's mama would go, hey, darling, I got your supper ready. 
and he'd quit what he was doing, clean up his tools. He had one of them double-decker roll around craftsman toolboxes. He didn't have a shed or nothing. He was a genuine shade tree mechanic. Had a, had a chain fall on a limb of a big oak tree in their backyard That's so he could pull motors and stuff. He'd go over there and wash his hands at the spigot, and then he'd go in the house where his wife would have his supper ready. And as far as I know, every Monday through Friday, his supper was the same thing. Two fried hot dog sandwiches on white toast with yellow mustard. If y'all want to see me after the show, I'll give you the recipe. <laughs> anyway, with me and Billy Ray would follow him up onto the back porch. He'd go in the kitchen and there'd be his supper sitting on a paper plate, two hot dog sandwiches and a Pabst Blue Ribbon beer that she'd church keyed open for him. And he'd look at that, and he'd look at his wife, and he'd say, darling, you're the best thing that ever happened to this old boy right here. Come over here, and she'd lean across the counter, and he'd give her a little jaw sugar, and she'd say, darling, I love you. And he'd say, I know you do. Look at what you fixed me. And he'd take him a big old pull on that Pabst Blue Ribbon, and he'd go, that's the coated bust enamel off your teeth just the way I like it. Come here, and he'd give her one more little peck, and then he'd head for the living room. Now, me and Billy Ray are standing on the back porch looking in the window because we can see right through the opening there to the living room, and his dad was headed for his chair. Now, his chair was a Berkline recliner covered in brown naga hide and black electrician's tape. Now, Billy Ray's dad would have his sandwiches in his left hand and that cold beer in the right hand, and he'd be headed for that chair. Now, if I had to describe Billy Ray's dad, Mr. Latham, if he'd have been three inches taller, it'd have been a circle. <laughs> a lot of fried hot dogs and perhaps blue ribbons went through that, man. Now, y'all probably know how the Berkline recliner works. Got that lever on the right side, what causes it to recline, right? Well, he would assume a position next to that chair where the lever was, and with both hands full, he couldn't operate the lever. So he'd just pretend it was a 650 Triumph motorcycle, and he'd start kicking it, kicking that lever. And just like any old Triumph motorcycle, it'd take about 30 kicks before it went, you know, Finally, he'd plop down in the recline position, and then he would move forward one step and assume a position just to the right of the footstool part, and it begin to sway left and right, getting that mass moving. And pretty soon, that left foot would start coming off the ground, and then that right foot, when he got over on that side, and pretty soon, them feet were coming off the ground as he was swaying. And he'd get way over to the right, and I'd say to Billy Ray, he's going to go over. Billy Ray would say, Daddy, you'll see, but you wait and see. And sure enough, he'd get way over to the right, and he'd kick that left foot up, and the next thing you know, he was a straddle of the footstool part. And then he would work himself down into the recliner, get his feet up on the footstool part, set his hot dog sandwiches on his stomach, and set that past blue ribbon on the end table right there on the left of his chair. Now the only other thing on that end table was a Philco record player. And he would reach over and unlatch it and flip the top back and then reach down inside and turn it on and we would hear it go <laughs> till it reached exactly 45 revolutions per minute. And then he would reach in and get the arm of that record player and put it down on the only 45 RPM record in their house and we would hear. We'd just sit down on the steps and wait because eventually we would hear, I'm so lonesome I could cry. Hear that lonesome. <coughs> Sometimes we would have to sit through 15 repetitions of Hank Williams 
But we knew that eventually we would hear I'm so lonesome I could cry And we were in them cars Sheep in the meadow and the cows in the corn Fish in the river and the horse in the barn And I was 12 years old Living in the country With a blue tick hound and a chestnut mare Me and Billy Ray, you know, were loaded for bear on a Saturday Living in the country When you're 12 years old Living in the country Seem like the only place to be The work's all done And we're headed for the river And we're going to catch all the fish In eastern Tennessee Billy Ray and me Stayed on his daddy's farm But the country couldn't hold me Well I've seen all the places that I wanted to see But I ain't seen nothing like East Tennessee And I'm glad to say I'm back in the country Cause when you get my age living in the country Seem like the only place to be All the fish in eastern Tennessee Billy Ray and me I was 10 years old My brother Eddie was 16 We were sitting around the dinner table and uh, my mother looked at my dad and said, Paul? My dad went, uh-oh. She said, I read in the Ladies Home Journal today that in order for a young man to be well-rounded, he needed to study music, so I have signed Eddie up for piano lessons. My brother choked on a piece of okra and fell in the floor. My dad looked at my mother and said, what? She said, that's right, I read in the ladies' home journal that for a young man to be well-rounded, he needed to take music lessons. My dad said, I think the only thing Eddie needs to be well-rounded is a good inside curveball. But she didn't argue with my mother when she'd read the ladies' home journal. And she said, so I want you to go out and find Ed a good used piano and put it in the house here so he can practice. My brother was crawling out the back door at the same time. My dad said, I don't know anything about piano. She said, it doesn't matter, just go buy one. You don't have to know anything. He said, well, I've got something for you to do. He said, you know, I've joined the, the VFW and the Commandant said that he wants us to wear our World War II uniforms. We're going to march in the 4th of July parade. So I want you to go up in the attic and get my, my dad was in the Merchant Marine during World War II. He ran convoys across the North Atlantic. He was an ensign about as low as you can get in the officer's corps, you know. But he was an ensign, and he said, go get my uniform, my dress uniform. I'm going to wear that in the parade. So after dinner, Mom went up and pulled that string, and the attic steps came back down, and she went way back there to some old trunk where she had put my dad's uniform, brought it down. He looked at it and said, boy, it looks good, don't it? He said, let me try it on. He put the jacket on, and somehow the button was about... 10 inches from the buttonhole. And he looked at my mother and said, I told you not to put my uniform in that hot attic. My uniform has shrunk three sizes. My mother just laughed. Well, the next day, my dad went <clears throat> to a Quonset hut out there between Morristown and Newport, and the sign on the front of it said, Uncle Sam's Military Salvage and Tire Recapping Center. 
Well, Dad went in there and told Uncle Sam what he needed, and he said, Mr. Hell, I hate to tell you this, but he said, there's been a run on uniforms. It seems like everybody had stored theirs in an attic, and they've all shrunk. <laughs> Dad said, well, I've got to have something to wear. And uh, he said to Uncle Sam, he said, don't you have anything at all left? He said, well, I do have one khaki uniform left, but it's a lieutenant commander's uniform. My dad said, ooh, lieutenant commander. No, I don't believe I could wear that. Sam said, well, just try it on. Well, it, it fit him perfectly, had the cap and everything with it. And Dad looked at it in the mirror there. He said, boy, it does look pretty good, don't it? Sam said, Mr. Harrell, I'll bet you had you stayed in the service, by now you would have been a lieutenant commander. So my dad agreed with him and bought the uniform. And that year he led the parade. <laughs> Outranked everybody. Anyway, dad was getting ready to walk out with that uniform. He looked like in the, in the dark back there. And the, he said, what is that back there in the back? He said, that's not a piano against the wall back there, is it? And Sam said, well, you wouldn't be in the market for a good used piano, would you? And Dad said, well, I might be. Sam said, well, come right back. And he opened up the counter, and Dad went back there, and he turned on the big lights back there. And my dad looked at that piano, and he went, ooh, boy, that's ugly. Sam said, you don't know anything about fine pianos, do you? So he sat in the top of this upright piano. There's four cases of Quaker State motor oil that Sam had bought at a fire sale price when the truck had turned over over near Newport. And unbeknownst to Sam, evidently, one of those cans had developed a leak and a whole quart of motor oil had leaked out across the top of that piano and down the front, causing the finish to crinkle up. Dad said, look at this piano. What, what kind of piano is this? He said, well, Mr. Harrell. He said, this is a genuine Steinberg piano. Dad said, I think I've heard of that. He said, well, of course you have. That's the same thing that Liberace plays. Dad said, but look at it, it's ugly. He said, you don't know anything at all about professional quality pianos, do you? He said, when you watch Liberace on television, he said, that piano he's playing has the same non-glare finish so that those bright lights don't reflect back into his eyes so he can't see to play. Dad said, well, that could come in handy. My wife's bad to buy 100 watt light bulbs. So Dad opened up the keyboard and there was one key there right about the middle. That wouldn't, that wouldn't come up. It was stuck down. And Dad pick it up, drop it, and it tunk, tunk. He said, this piano's ruined. He said, it's got a bad key right here. Sam said, oh, you don't know anything at all about professional quality pianos, do you? He said, when you watch Liberace on television, does he ever look at his hands when he's playing? Dad said, well, no. He's always looking at the camera and grinning. He said, how do you think he knows where his hands are going? That's called the signal key. Soon as his hand passes that key right there, he knows exactly where he's at all the time. He said, that's a professional quality piano right there. My dad said, what do you take for it? He said, $27.75. My dad said, I don't have but $16. And Sam about broke his arm taking his money. <laughs> dad said, I'll be here at 8 o'clock in the morning to pick it up. So he called his Sunday school teacher, Max Singer. And Max came and helped him load that piano up. And they hauled it back to my house. Now, I could tell you what it took to get that piano from Max's truck up into our living room six steps up onto the porch, but just suffice it to say, it took a John Deere tractor with a manure bucket to do the job. But by golly, Mama had her piano. My brother took one lesson and never took another one, but she didn't care because a new issue of the Ladies Home Journal had come out and she was off onto something else. But that old piano sat there in the living room and my dad had his had his bowling trophies on the top of it. Nobody ever played it. We were getting ready to move into town about three years later, and my mother had called her sister and her sister's husband over to help us move. And I heard mom and her, her sister in there, my Aunt Maddie, talking and packing up the kitchen. Mama said, Maddie, there's something I want you to have. Maddie said, it's that set of blue wheel of dishes that Mama wanted me to have, ain't it? And she said, no, it's better than that. I want you to have our piano. And Maddie looked around the corner at that piano, and she said, ooh, I don't think that'd look good in my living room. Well, about that time, her husband came in and looked at it, and he said, well, I could fix that. I could strip that right off and finish it, and it'd go with the oak furniture in our living room just right. So they took that piano back to North Carolina. My Aunt Maddie learned to play it. 
by golly, within, within a year, she was playing everything in the Broadman Hymnal. She could play everything she heard on the radio, and her favorite tune was a tune called The Blues for Dixie that was recorded by Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys. And sometimes I'd be out folks singing around the country and I would accidentally go above the cornbread line up there where they put sugar in their cornbread. And I'd have to come back down and get me a shot of real cornbread and I'd always stop by my Aunt Maddie's and she'd play me the piano. <laughs> C is stuck and it's a little out of tune But I would love to hear you play the blues for Dixie I dream of watermelons in a tub of ice Fried chicken and fried okra and white gravy on white rice Every time I hear you play the blues for Dixie Lightning bugs begin to flicker, crickets start to sing That melody is as pretty as magnolias in the spring I'll go in the kitchen, you sit down at the keys I'll whip up some cornbread while you pound the ivories I'd love to hear you play the blues for Dixie Shed a tear or two, but I ain't afraid to risk it If I could get to hear you play the blues for Dixie There's an old piano in the living room Middle C is stuck and it's a little out of tune But I would love to hear you play And Maddie, can't you hear me when I say I would love to hear you play the blues for Dixie just one more time for me. Thank you all so much.